listeners, we are back with our second episode of our brand new NAF Grassroots series. Now, on our first episode, we had a chat to Yazingham and heard all about season planning. But this time, we're going to be taking a look at some horse fitness. Now, horse fitness is such a key part of our sport. So we thought we'd bring in some pros to talk about how best to get your horse fit. So... I have two guests on the show today. I'm delighted to firstly introduce five-star rider, Rose Nesbitt. Thank you for coming on the show. Hi, thank you for having me. We're delighted to have you on the show and hear some of your advice on getting our horses in tip-top condition. And actually talking about condition, our next guest is a lady who's going to tell us all about how fitness and nutrition go hand in hand and how to get the best from our horses Welcome to the show. One of NAF nutritionists is Griselda Beaumont. Hello. Thank you for coming on the show, Gris. That's a pleasure. Now, horse fitness can be a bit of a difficult thing for a lot of people. It can be mind boggling sometimes as to know where to start. We obviously all know we need our horses in tip top condition. But Rose, where do you start with your horse fitness? Um, I think... It would all start probably from living in Shropshire. I have hills up and down, um, really steep hills. And actually from from when I have young horses in, they all start with hacking to get their fitness, to get their core fitness um, really good. I think it's maybe a little bit old school, but I think it's a really important um, base for their fitness to um, and it hardens their legs. And it's just a it's a great way to start um, getting them fit. So if somebody was looking to get their horse ready for the season and don't know where to start, you'd suggest going out on quite a few hacks a week. How many would you suggest roughly? Uh, All my horses hack uh, three times a week. Um, And some of the younger ones, they would just walk, trot up the hills. And then my top horse, he would be going on an hour long hacks, um, trotting up every hill there is, walking down them, obviously. Um, and it just is a great way to start from, yes, yeah, sort of from December, beginning of January, they'll all start um, They'll all start doing that. And how much of a general fitness base would you recommend people have before they pick up the pace? Because it can be a fine line on knowing when to push for a bit more and when to know that actually we've got to continue at this level a bit longer. Yeah, no, it's a it's a fine line and a balance you sort of, I think, learn throughout the years. And as you build up and go through the levels, I think you get a much better understanding of it. Um, I I would start introduced with the cantering work and going to the gallops from about mid-January, um, end of January. And then you just slowly build up, making it getting a good balance of of your fitness work at home and then going to the gallops. And and then uh, my top horse goes to the water, tread, a water treadmill as well. Um, so, yeah, it's just fitting it all in and keeping a nice balance of everything. So when you start galloping, would you say that's about four weeks into your hacking? Yeah, about yes, about about four or five weeks after they've done all their all their road work, um, I would then start introducing the going to the gallops. Um, and we've actually had such a dry we had such a dry February this year. I was actually started my canter work in our in some fields at home. The ground is amazing for February, and I couldn't believe I was cantering just at home um so I started introducing some interval cantering at home and then and then started going to the gallops a bit more we have been very very lucky with our weather it has been a brilliant winter compared to other years and Grizz we know that you know our horses are going to go out get fit start galloping and actually a lot of us find the recovery sometimes can be quite a challenge to get right how important is it to nail that recovery after going out and doing your fast work Uh, I actually think recovery um, comes in actually from building up the fitness initially. So it's almost like you have to think about it as to be able to recover. You need to be going at it from the start. Um, And by what I mean by that is looking at overall soundness, uh, making sure you're equipping them with the right nutrients uh, in order to be able to provide the body uh, to nourish itself so that it can recover electrolytes and things like that and being able to put back in what you've taken out usually we don't really recommend electrolytes until you've actually seen the horse sweat as such um 
we get asked a lot about salt licks. Uh, I would say with salt licks, um, it's fine to give horses free access to salt um, as long as it's natural. So we uh, at NAF, we do like Himalayan salt lick. We've got our electrosalts to support that. Um, what we like to do is say, put it in a powder, put it in the food or the water. Make sure your horse has got access to water all the time. Um, and like I said, if you want to give them a salt lick, that's fine. But try and make sure it's natural. The other thing to take into account, which I didn't mention, was travel. Um, I think sometimes we think that, you know, I travel a lot with my horses. I travel to Roses sometimes, she's only up the road. But, you know, you travel a lot and you don't take into account that your horse is almost working when they're traveling as well. Uh, I think there was a study done. I'm not sure when it was done saying that that horses effectively, I think it was three hours travel or something like that was equivalent to so much trot work. So you think, well, hang on, they're just stood on a box, you know. But if you think when they're balancing themselves and things like that, when you're going around corners and things like that, we would advise if horses are travelled a lot, uh, particularly for competition, it may be worth topping them up um, with electrolytes and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, and particularly in hot weather as well. That's, of course, that comes with it. But, um, yeah, no fit. Don't look for electrolytes with no fillers in. Um, and then very often in electrolytes, something you can look for is so you can have like a glucose in there. We use a dextrose. It's actually to aid electrolyte uptake in the body. So it just synergizes the ingredients a little bit better. But it's it's pretty straightforward. You sweat, you take a little bit of salt just to put back in what you've taken out. I think it's interesting what you mentioned there about travel, because it is something that many of us often overlook. But let's say we've gone to the gallops and done some fast work with our horse or even after an event. You know, we see a lot of people calling off horses legs, which is fantastic. But it can be confusing as to know what to use, because some people say gel, some people say clay, some people say ice. Grizz, what do you recommend as the best option for trying to get our horse's legs cool? Um, I'm old fashioned, I'm afraid. Historically, I've always recommended leg clays. Um, and I think leg clays probably, uh, you know, they're etched in me from when I was little, uh, because I, you know, I, from my experience, I can see that they work. You want something that we, you don't want something to cook the leg. And what I mean by that, gel's really good there and then. Pop gel on because a gel, when that evaporates, it actually takes the heat with it if you've got the right gel. Um, so like we've got our brands called Ice Cool. And it's called Ice Cool because what we want to do is the gel, like I said, it helps the, the heat, helps extract the heat from the leg. But the clay and like I'm a big fan of the clay because after you've finished cross country, you walk your horse around a little bit, let them cool off. Um, when you wash them down and everything like that, you might do that again just to get a bit you've missed or something off. Put your clay on the leg. I tend to do one leg at a time. If you do a four, can just get messy. Um, so put your clay on the leg. You can put it like just around. We tend to recommend just putting it down the back of the tendon, so down the back of the leg. Some people do the knee upwards, but really what you want to do is be able to um, support sort of tired legs, tighten them, et cetera. Um, and then what you do is we recommend then get your number out, your number bib, put it in the water for a second, put it round the clay and then bandage your leg with a wrap on as well um, or gamgee or whatever we want to call it these days. But basically, yeah, clays, gels, they're all much for muchness, but clays you should take off the next morning. Some people take it off that night when they get home. They're 24 hour leg clays. So next day, take the bandages off, peel everything off and they should come off quite easily with water again that process of taking the clay off with water is cooling the leg down again so it's almost having two applications but the the trick with leg clay is trying to keep it as clay like as possible some people use kitchen towel some people use cling film uh, anything to keep that leg as as moist as possible that clay really um, and then it keeps working it'll drag the heat out that leg well, there you go, listeners. Also another use for your number. No, that's fantastic advice because it is an area that I think some people can find quite confusing as to what to do. And that's really clear there that how much the clay can help drag the heat out. Rose, we often think of horse fitness when we refer to, you know, galloping and getting them cross country fit, which 100% is. That is a big part of the horse fitness that we need to get right because cross country is so key in our sport. 
But how do you get your horses fit for dressage and show jumping? Because it's a whole different type of fitness and a different type of muscle that these horses have to use. And I think sometimes when we think horse fitness, we only think of galloping, but actually it is also fitness in our jumping and dressage stages as well. Yeah, no, I think that's really important as well. I think for the dressage is just, um, I try and do quite a lot of like short sessions just to build up their muscles and get them using obviously it's very different muscles they're using when you're schooling for dressage than when you're when you're galloping really they're having to sit more in the dressage they're having to use their hind muscles more and um so I just I build that up when they um when they're getting fitted by just doing sort of short short good sessions and with the jumping I suppose um when my horses all start jumping after their holidays, they start just by doing sort of grids and then building it up. And then when they've done some sort of gymnastic work, then they'll build up to jumping a course. And when you're doing your fitness program, we obviously have our plan on how fit we want them to be and the process that we're using. But do yeah. you use anything to monitor your process to know what stage you're at? I I always like print out a monthly calendar and I I have my events and have my I know where I'm going and I actually just work back from that um they would always have a canter three days before a run quite a like good fast like good blow um and that's basically how I do it and it seems to work for me um but yeah just just basically looking at your end goal and working backwards um to make a good plan that makes sense so that then at least you've got it mapped out and you can follow where you're at yeah with our sport, our seasons are quite long. You know, most people, it's March to October. It's a long old time to have your horse fit and ready to go. How do you plan your season rows for longevity of your horses? I think just like I said at the beginning, variety of fitness work. I think you really can't go wrong with that. And it seems to touch wood have worked really well so far. I think a mixture of just don't go to the gallops the whole time and think that's the best way to get a horse really fit. I think a mixture of of long hacks, of going to the gallops, of a water treadmill, if you can get have access to one. Um, that's been a really vital part of my top horse's fitness regime in the last two years. Um, it uses different muscles again. It means you're not on their backs. It gives them a day to sort of recover and not, have a saddle and a rider on them but also it is so beneficial and building up building up muscles and getting them working in a different way um so I think yeah just a variety is is really important um for longevity if somebody didn't have access to a water treadmill near them or on their yard or anything would the likes of going to the beach have a similar effect yeah, definitely. I've always been jealous of people who've be- had access to a beach or a big river or something like that. It effectively is the same. Um, sadly, I don't really have one that close. But yeah, gosh, I'm very jealous of people who could go to the beach and trot through water on the beach. Yeah. And Grizz, um, in regards to longevity, we've talked about how long our seasons are and how we plan our fitness for longevity. Is there a way that we can plan our fitness and nutrition to aid that longevity as well? Definitely. I think it's horses for courses to start with. So you know your own horse. Um, Speaking as a nutritionist, but with a rider in mind and being a rider myself, it's up to you and you know your horse, how much protein they should have, et cetera, et cetera. But you know that element. In terms of longevity, and this one is always... A standard me sometimes with you always get horses that you think that will never going in that way of going that confirmation that will never last for the next 10 years surely and then you see it so you do often get these freaks as I call them that just defy every element of science but the the underpinning rule really for all is soundness and we all work towards achieving soundness and by doing that in my estimate, every horse, and I've always been a firm believer of this before I started working for NAF, I'd always believed every horse needed a joint supplement. And for many of us over the years, we've experienced how joint injections work and in some cases don't work and the risks that are 
you know we we actually take on board when when we decide to have them and we know that they keep some horses on the road but by simply putting a joint supplement in your food you're looking at addressing the day-to-day wear and tear you get on the horse's joints which regardless of whether you're that freak or whether your confirmation's perfect or just terrible you know you will always get that wear and tear so that comes into the equation you know whoever you are um but the natural anti-inflammatory processes um and the exposure that you know as eventers we're looking at rose saying about fitness and going to the gallops going on the water treadmill and things like that so the variability of the surface, I think is really important. I noticed 10 days ago when we were looking at starting the season, you know, and like Rose said, we've had a dry February, but it's actually been quite deep all of a sudden, you know, and so those horses have been conditioned on ground that's quite firm. And now they've come into ground that's quite deep. So how do you look to safeguard that? Well, to me, I would look at joint supplements and then to help build them up throughout the season. Um, I would look at maybe a muscle supplement as well. Um, And when you look at joint supplements, you know, I always take into account antioxidants. We all know about glucosamin and MSM and all all these things that come into play. But what we don't take into account is the anti-inflammatory process. Um, And the anti-inflammatory process has to be combated by something, and that is antioxidants. And what we don't realise, and I always say this to people, is anti-inflammatory and inflammation is something that naturally, you know, when you're walking down the road yourself to post a letter, you will get, you know, you get that inflammatory response. Um, Sometimes you might sit down in a chair and get up again and think, am I getting old? You know, I definitely am. But um, what I was trying, the point I'm trying to make is our horses feel a bit like that. And antioxidants are a little bit like them eating, us eating fruit. So by eating fruit and veg, basically, we help to keep our systems running smoothly and the same with our horses. So look for antioxidants because that's what they provide. They flush out toxins, basically, that can surround the joints and soft tissue and so on and so forth. So then it frees up your nutrients that you're feeding in your joint supplement and whatever to actually nourish the area. Um, and in a nutshell, you know, saying it without getting too technical, I, I think that's the best way to describe it. So in response to your question, yes, you know, soundness is something I see as a key element in terms of longevity um, and, and muscles, you know, going through the season. And I know, Rose, you see this with your youngsters to what they start off as, as when, you know, you're looking at them in October, November, December as sort of week four year olds or week five year olds and then muscles dropped off and all this. Um, you look at amino acids, they're building blocks. Um, so they can help build them up. But what you must look at as well is balancing that with your vitamin E's, your seleniums and so on and so forth. So feed a complexity of ingredients. Don't just look for one. Um, we look at something called Empire which really helps to it's to build muscle mass and power basically it's like giving uh yourself at the gym you know when you think oh i'd like to look like the hulk tomorrow so i'll take my protein (laughs) shake but that sort of thing and you know we want to build our horses up in the right way we want them to have nice top line you know get a 10 and down the center line you know come up from these sixes don't look like a scrawny thoroughbred build them up and that's really what we look empath to achieve for us um, and then underpin it with with joint activity so yeah so joints and muscles I think for longevity myself personally I think it's great trying to find all the right bits of the puzzle and piecing them together and that's how you can create this overall sound and bulk like horse as you say the hulk is what we're after <laughs> yeah, that's it it is it's it's I always think that's it you know you you look at how eventing has changed over the years and and the the dressage has become such an important element, you know. I mean, I did a test last year. I felt like just going home. (laughs) You know, you think, oh, well, this is just pointless. But, um, you know, and then you think, that's the fun of the cross country. But I know that I'm lucky and I don't live far from Rose. And yes, I would like a beach in Shropshire, but, you know, it's, it's not going to happen in this side of the next ice age, I don't think. But, what we've got here are amazing hills and, you know, you can really fit in horses on these hills. And the other thing is, like Rose said, is is the 
variability in the conditions and a joint supplement like i said we do super flex five star super flex and we look to have that supporting the antioxidant approach initially and then you build your ingredients in from that and the one thing that i must say and i do talk a lot so you'll have to excuse me <laughs> is uh, what i must say and the one thing that i always try to get across to people is i try not to have an expensive muck heap now, for many of us, I do the same sometimes, you know, and the best way I can I can make this understandable is I like dairy milk chocolate um, a lot. But if I buy chocolate with more cocoa in, sometimes it tastes disgusting. And quite honestly, I think, oh, who would do that? But the point I'm trying to make is that when you look at ingredients, you need them to synergize with each other and to all work together. You know, I wouldn't just have cornflakes for breakfast. I'd just have milk with it as well. So you need to build these things into your diet at the right ratios. Otherwise, what you end up with is two things. You're wasting your money. It's not edible or you get an expensive muck heap. Um, and, and that's really what we don't want is the expensive mucky horses are expensive enough as they are, um, you know, without having, um, you know, feeding them what we perceive to be more when actually it's just going straight through them. I really like that idea of making sure all the ingredients work together. And I'm 100% on side that dairy milk is amazing. Because <laughs> I go through bars and bars of that. <laughs> I love it. So we talk about longevity and trying to make our horses last, which is really key. But Rose, you have a lot of young horses come through as well as obviously your top horses. How do you manage your fitness plans of the young horses? Are they different to the types that you'd have of an older horse? Probably not different, but just less. They do less. Um, I think it's, it's such a fine line with the younger horses. You want them to go to a competition and not be crazily fit because they're then going to be difficult in the dressage and it's just finding a really good balance my young horses um yeah do lots of hacking they wouldn't go to the gallops until they're they're at novice level um i would just build up their fitness like cantering on the grass at home and and hacking and um yeah so it's it is different it's less intense um but i just try and keep it really varied as well and just do a little bit less of it really and I think that's a good point there, that people can really utilise what they have. They don't have to spend all their money going to a gallops and really utilise your grass you've got at home. And like you say, if you're lucky to live somewhere like you guys do with loads of hills, use yeah. them. Yeah, definitely. My youngsters all go up and down the hills and actually the muscle and the fitness they build up from, from just doing that is, it is amazing, really. We've spoken a lot about going up the gallops and the water treadmill, which is, you know, amazing for fitness, especially if we're looking to get our horses at really, really peak fitness. But sometimes we don't need them uber, uber fit because then they're just going to explode in the dressage for us and be hard to manage. So how do we make sure that our horses are as fit as they need to be for each level? How do we make sure we know that they're 80 fit or 90 fit or 100 fit? If you look at your program and your prep runs, I think um, prep runs give you a really good idea of of how fit your horse is. Um, so you might have a an event in mind and you might do that event. And I think at the end of the cross country, you would realize sort of if your horse is really blowing or sold up absolutely fine. Um, I think also a, a good idea is to you can find out maybe the distance of your horse. Um, and then that just gives you a, a better idea of if you need to do a bit more or a bit less. And also, I think, speak to your coaches. I think they work really closely with you and your horse and they'll know know your horse well. Um, and I think they, they will give you really good support and um, they're very knowledgeable and will know if you're sort of doing too much or maybe need to do a little bit more. I really like that measuring out the distances because it's something so simple that you can just do at home, measure out your distances in the field and make sure you're hitting them. Yeah, exactly. And it's very easy to do. Um, um, yeah, and just find out how, how far the cross country is. You don't want to get there and realise it's a lot further than you perhaps anticipated. Um, or you don't want to get there and have a quite a fit horse and realise it's actually only four minutes long or something. Do you know what I mean? You need to sort of get a good gauge on that. And then I think 
your horse should be spot on and hopefully ready to go round round the um, right distance. And I think this next question is probably a question for both of you. What would be any of your advice to a horse that isn't naturally energized and a big galloper and wanting to get fit because there's quite a few out there who are fantastic eventers but they don't have that natural you know buzz of a thoroughbred who really wants to gallop and get fit what would be your advice on getting a horse a little bit buzzier I would say um do your canter work with another horse so my top horse he's actually he's actually very lazy at the gallops on his own he doesn't work very well he finds it all quite boring um so I actually tag along. I'm very lucky the gallops I use with we're friends with the trainer and he I actually tag along with the back at the back of a lot. Um so I might I'm at the end of a string of racehorses. Um and that has been I've been doing that for the last two years and it has made a huge difference in his fitness. Um he now pulls me up the gallops and works so much better. So if you can do your fitness work with a couple of friends or something like that and it just makes your makes your horses just sort of want to work a bit more and actually you'd get you'll get so much more out of it I think that's really good actually because it's working out what's right for your horse and trying to utilize what you've got to enable them to really get their head in the game yeah yeah definitely would you agree Gris what would be your advice for sparking up a horse (laughs) well no I, I thought that was pretty good I mean we, from a nutrition perspective, firstly, obviously, we can get problems as in deficient in, well, you can get little viruses throughout the season. Sometimes they go completely undetected um, or you can get them having low red blood cell count. So that obviously prevents how much oxygen is getting through to their whole muscle network. So, you know, you're not utilizing the horse's best response to its uh, capability really so what you want to do is be able to understand firstly the process that's going on or you know on the other hand a bit like rose sometimes you want to feel like you want to give it a big pony club kick to say come on guys let's go um so when you look at supporting its energy metabolism um often we recommend b vitamins um one thing that's actually completely misinterpreted with horses is the use of iron. And I myself, uh, as a human, if you like, has have always suffered with low grade anemia. So I've always had to supplement to a degree with iron. Um, now, horses, we often assumed until fairly recently that was a similar sort of thing. So you'd see supplements with big iron counts in there. Um, but actually, that's not the case. Uh, horses, in fact, don't need that much iron and utilize it in their body quite well. So we, we don't really need to worry too much about iron. But in terms of what they do need is a lot of, like I said, B bits. I know our vets can come to play sometimes and say, right, he's had a little virus. Let's give him a B12 booster or something along those lines. And so you can have that done intravenously. But what you can do is support them with a little supplement or something along those lines just daily. And what you can do normally with these types of energy supplements is you can boost them up two to three days before they're running. So, for instance, if Rose was running on, you know, sort of Friday and she said, look, you know, he's really quiet at the moment. What do I do? I'd say, look, just drop 60 mil into his food at night. Um, we do something called energy liquid. Ironically, it's called energy. Um and, and it would help just to give them a bit of an instant boost. Um, you can get syringes as well. The difficulty with syringes is they take about two hours to work. So whereas with your liquid, if you pop that into their system at night, that's there ready to be used, that energy is. Whereas your syringe, it'll be ready in two hours. So it, it takes a bit longer to cook, really. But what you've got to do is just be able to understand what your horse needs when they need it. Um, and when's best to feed it. And the other thing I will mention is energy is not sugar. So very often, again, the whole humanization of our animals, as you know, I do as much as the next person. I'm looking at a pink rug currently in the field, but, you know, and I'm sure my horse appreciates it greatly. But what I'm trying to get at is horses do not need a lot of sugar for energy. So while we might have a Mars bar and think that's just, you know, topped up all our systems energy liquid what that does is quite honestly it's putting the b vitamins into the right places 
And you're also looking, like I said, little viruses, particularly in yard environments and taking them out to competitions and things like that. And actually, you can pick up little bugs here and there. And most of them we perceive through the respiratory system. So you could one day come into the stables and see a big lump of snot basically outside their stable door. Uh, green, white, yellow, whatever colour it is. Um, we worry. And then we call a vet or something like that and say, oh, they've got some heinous disease. They can pick these things up from the hay that they're eating. Sometimes if you think the way you're traveling them with a hay net, they can't drain. And so what's happening is overnight, they all this gunk comes out. But we do a breathing supplement called Respirator Boost. It's 48 hours it's got a guarantee on it to work. You literally give it 60 mil, like I said. You can split it between morning and night. It's my favorite thing to recommend because I've seen it work very quickly. You just have to stand clear. Yeah, make sure you don't get showered in. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's so difficult with, I find, with, you know, when you look on nutrition and how that can influence horse fitness, and performance it's looking at how to keep that horse fit and you can't keep a horse at the same level of fitness you have to allow them to come down to pick them back up and so on and so forth so you know when they come down if they've had a run and they feel a bit you know sort of tired and things like that and then they they see their mate Steve in the next field going for a good canter round and Alan thinks he'll go and have a good run round with Steve as well but he's really tired and actually you know it's then the owner takes him or rider takes him to a competition a few days later he's just overdone it like we would you know and then they're more susceptible exactly like we are just to pick up a few bugs here and there so it's it's really it's safeguarding them just giving them a few things every now and then just to feed from the floor, clear everything out of them. If you do feed hay nets or anything like that, um, that's absolutely fine. Um, but sometimes it's good, even if you feed them in a bowl, put it on the floor or something, just give them some drainage time, try and get them to drain a little bit. Um, and you can feed, there are immune products you can feed if you're concerned about challenged immunity. Um, you always look for something called lysine that helps with immune function. Um, and you want sort of a blend of immunity. And again, I bring in that word antioxidant as well, herbs, to help sort of flush out all the, the rubbish that's accumulated in the systems. So, yeah, so it's straightforward. Straightforward, nice and easy. And Rose, a few of our listeners may even have quite big aims this year. They may be going to the likes of badminton's coming up very soon, or there's the B80 Championships at Bramham. Some even may be eyeing up the Riding Club Championships. That's a long format, three day event. What would be your fitness advice for preparing for some of those bigger grassroots championships? Um, I think planning is essential in um, preparing for championships. I think it's really good to make a plan and work backwards from your from your end goal, so your championship. And then it just gives you a really good idea of time scale. Um, obviously, fitness um, for any type of horse doesn't happen overnight. Um, so you need to just give yourself enough time and make sure... Um, yeah, make sure that's all going to all gonna go to plan. Um, I think depending on your horse as well I think it um the breed of your horse um obviously thoroughbreds would be naturally a lot fitter whereas your sort of a maybe typical Irish or Irish draft might take a little bit longer to get fitter. I think that's been some fantastic advice from you both and hopefully we'll just help some of our listeners know what track to go down when they're approaching fitness especially if they've got an end goal coming up like a championship or something like that just on how fitness and nutrition as well go hand in hand and how they can help each other. So thank you both for coming on the show today and giving your advice. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Oh, no problem at all. Listeners, I hope you have really enjoyed this little insight into fitness and nutrition with Rose and Grizz and have enjoyed the second podcast on our new NAF Grassroots series. We have our third coming very, very soon. And I think that's all going to be about cross-country recovery. So do stay tuned for that. But that's all we've got time for for now. Thank you for listening. And we'll be back soon with more. This is what the Olympic gold medalist, Carl Hester, has to say on Team NAF. My job in all of this, of course, is to be able to say to the experts 
you know, this is what I feel the horse is doing, this is what I would like it to look like, what do you suggest? And I'm lucky to be able to have somebody uh, that I can ask those questions to, because of course they are the experts, they're the people that I have to put my trust in and the horses, you know, we want to ride on teams, we have to think of safe sport, we know that NAF leads the way in that. I have this really wonderful relationship that I feel is trustworthy, I can ask what I like, and at the end of the day it's how our horses look, and I mean, I think we could safely say that, you know, when you look at the type of horses we have and the covering of muscle and, and condition that they're in, that things are really working well for us.